Welcome, folks. This is the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee. It is August 28th. Um, this is our second meeting of uh, this summer. Uh, our session, we have up to six meetings. So it's the second one, right? And um, the first thing that we're going to be doing this morning is getting a review from Ben, our legal counsel, Ben Lobogoski, on the pretrial supervision program. And we will also, at the end of this presentation, along with, we have Judge Zone with us, uh, Terry Corzon from the courts, and Commissioner Demo, someone from Dallas and Al Um We also have the state's attorney represented here as the uh, defender general because they may, they're not scheduled to testify, but I wanted them in the room in case we have any questions pertaining to them. The pretrial supervision program is new. Um, that is um, a program where someone has been charged and they are placed back in the community with conditions and DOC will be monitoring those conditions. The decision that we are going to have to make along with DLC, it's guidance, but along with DLC, there was only about 600,000 that was put in the budget for this particular program to start up. 600,000 is not gonna carry it through all 14 counties. So there was language that was put in the bill that um, it could be, rolled out in one or two counties to see how it starts to work. And this committee in conjunction with DOC will make decisions as to where in the state that program will start. So in order to understand how we make a decision, we need to understand what the program is. So we have Ben, that's gonna come up, I hope. <laughs> And Dan, Ben has a PowerPoint presentation. And why don't I do this to, we've got the, I can share copper. Yeah. Why I give this. It's to, just gonna be a minute on the copies. Yeah, let me give that to the top. Um, because I think it's really, I know a few of us here under, know this process of the pre -trans. Vision and went through the House Corrections and Institutions Committee, and went through the House Judiciary Committee, and went through the Senate Judiciary. So some of us are aware of this, but in order for all of us in the committee to understand what the program is proposed to do, um, I've asked Ben to put together a PowerPoint to go through the basics <clears throat> of the pretrial supervision, what the structure is, and how it will be carried out. So Ben, welcome. You're far down the table. I'm not I am. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. For the record, uh, Ben Novogrodsky from the Office of Legislative Council. Uh, it is August 28th. I still refuse to believe that fall is here on Carl's doorstep. So we're still in summer. Um, the kids are in school. Yeah, they started. They are, but still. <laughs> Um, it helps your household a little bit. It does. Having a routine, <laughs> everybody going to the same place, yes, mm -hmm. it's very helpful. <laughs> um, but as Chair Emin said, I, I'm going to be doing an overview of the new pretrial supervision program, um, and I'll share my screen for to show the, the PowerPoint that you have before you. Um, so bear with me one moment, please. Okay. We all are out of practice. And if folks have questions as Ben goes along, please ask, because it's going to be really important to understand the pre-trial supervision. Um, so yeah, pre-trial supervision program. Um, to start though, just as a reminder and to kind of, I guess, reiterate what Sharon has just said, what the mandate for this committee is today is to review the program and provide recommendations to DOC and eventually the General Assembly on the most prudent use of any funds appropriated to the program 
and the geographic areas to first implement it. And that's because of the funding shortage essentially for the program is that there's in their insufficient funds to roll it out statewide. So um, this committee's input on where to start would be key to getting it started. Um, and then, as I said, these recommendations are due to DOC by September 1st. So really need to make a decision today, unfortunately. <laughs> and then to the General Assembly by November, November 15th. And I believe it was structured that way to basically see if between these recommendations and sort of anything else that happens between now and then, DOC could come back um, for further guidance from, from this committee before the recommendations go to the Okay, um, quick question, uh, trying to remember from appropriations, were, were these funds, uh, general funds mm -hmm. are sort of not anything to do with the justice reinvestment? Correct, yeah, general funds, I, I, my, my, if I recall correctly, I believe it was 640,000 appropriated to DOC for five positions, I could be off, um, but that's if memory serves. Okay. <clears throat> um, so let's start with the overview of the program. So we're gonna have a kind of a quick overview and then I'll get into details on the later slides. So this is governed by statute, uh, Title 13, Section 7555. Um, it's also the way it operates is that it's imposed as a condition of release by the courts under 13 VSA 7554, um, A1H and A2G. Um, only certain defendants are eligible for placement in the program. Um, the, to be placed, it has to be court ordered. So the court determines whether these eligible participants or, or defendants are suitable for placement. And then this is DOC administered. So court ordered, but DOC operates it um, with various supervision levels that are determined by evidence-based screenings conducted by the department. Um, and there's also a compliance and review procedure of those conditions later on to see if they need to be changed, um, removed, added to, uh, what have you. So Ben, are you gonna go into what determines eligible defendants? Yes. Okay. Um, so again, the governing statutes, as I said, 13 VSA 7554, for those that aren't um, as familiar, um, this governs release prior to trial. So. Um, anybody that is released, they are either released on their own personal recognizance, so without conditions, or released subject to, to conditions, and those are outlined in the statute. Um, they, the court assesses various factors to determine if those conditions need to be imposed, and there are a list of various factors that the court considers in imposing those conditions, uh, risk of flight, seriousness of the offense, the number of offenses, um, this new condition that was added this year actually is whether there are conditions already imposed for pretrial release, probation, parole, another form of supervision, um, and various other factors that I'll, I'll leave to you to, to, to read. So the key for the pretrial supervision is the person's been charged, they go to an arraignment, mm -hmm. and then the court will decide is bail set is bailed not set, is the person going to be detained in a correctional facility? Those are basically the decisions at that point that a court can make. Right, um, for the most part. Um, you know, everybody is presumed to be released as a right in Vermont, as a constitutional right, so it's really an exception to the rule to detain them. Um, so actually a good example of this is that if you read the news over um, the past few days in Burlington, there was a shooting that um, the defendant there is being held without bail. That's because she was charged with first degree murder, which is a violent felony. And that is one of the bases or the exceptions that someone can be held um, or carries a possible life sentence. So either of those factors can be a reason why someone can be held without bail. Um, but most people are released. Um, Sometimes they don't have bail imposed, they're just released subject to conditions or on their own. So those conditions can be like, for instance, for a DUI, don't drink and drive, don't possess alcohol. Um, sometimes there's a court mandate to go get a, a drug and alcohol screening to see if there's a greater issue at play. So those are just an example of some conditions that can be imposed by the court uh, at arraignment or really at any time prior to trial. So for this particular pre-trial supervision. I'm going to kind of help walk through some of the basics because I know some folks here aren't in Judiciary Committee or under, we're in corrections to know some of the little nuances. 
So currently, if someone is arraigned and charged and arraigned and they are released back to the community, the conditions are set by the court. Currently, who supervises that person in the community? No one. So that's important to remember because what this pretrial supervision program is attempting to do is have DOC supervise some of those folks in correct in the community who are not being supervised now. So that's important to remember. Mm -hmm. That's the goal of this program. And getting into the program, um, again, pretrial supervision is a new condition which is governed by the VSA 7555. And the purpose of the program is to assist those who are eligible through the use of those evidence-based strategies um, to improve pretrial compliance with conditions of release, to coordinate and support the provision of pretrial services when appropriate. So though that would be like, like drug and alcohol screenings to get them help if they need it, um, to ensure attendance at court appearances and to decrease the potential to recidivate while awaiting trial. So that is the general purpose of the program. Um, and we'll get into how it really works, um, unless there are any other questions. Right? I'll keep my mouth shut. <laughs> yeah, you're good. Uh, well, seeing none, what is the el eligibility? Well, it's really simple. There are two uh, bases to be eligible. One, you have to be accused of violating conditions of release pursuant to 13 VSA 7559. That is a criminal charge in and of itself. So if you've uh, violated conditions and the prosecutor deems it necessary to file charges against you, they would do it pursuant to this statute. Um, so if you've, been, if you've been charged, you can be eligible. Um, or the defendant has at least five pending court dockets against them. Um, and a court docket can include many different offenses within it um, or can include one. But, um, you know, this is typically charged... Uh, this was the discussion in committee over this eligibility requirement was those real problem offenders specifically you know where they may have 70 plus dockets against them for retail theft um so they would be captured as those are eligible so they can be placed in the program but there's a further analysis to determine whether they should be uh, so any questions on the eligibility criteria Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so is does somebody make a recommendation to the judge? Because I understood you to say the judge makes the determination. Um, yeah, yeah, so we'll get into it. But basically, either party or the court can move to put okay. someone into the program. Okay. Uh, so what is the procedure? Uh, so at arraignment or at a later hearing, a party of the court may move that an eligible defendant be reviewed to determine whether they're placed into the program. It's scheduled, the review is scheduled upon a receipt of a DOC report containing its recommendations pertaining to the supervision level that's appropriate for the defendant. Um, the court would review the report and schedule a hearing to determine if the person should be placed. Um, but there's sort of, that determination is made by assessing whether placement in the program will either reasonably mitigate the person's, uh, or ensure, reasonably ensure the defendant's appearance in court reasonably mitigate the risk of flight or reasonably ensure protection of the public. So that's sort of the determining factor once you're eligible. Um, and there are certain factors that go into that determination. Uh, those factors that the court considers are the nature of the violation of conditions that were charged under 7559, the nature and circumstances of the underlying offense. So if they were charged with retail theft, um, and then maybe the violation of the condition is don't commit a new crime, and yet they committed another crime. Um, they're, they're per the person's history, prior convictions, history of violence, medical, mental health needs, history of supervision, and the risk of flight. Um, any risk or undue burden to third parties or risk to the public safety that may result from placement within the community. And then any other, anything else that's relevant to the determination. So any questions on sort of the, the initial procedure at the outset once uh, to determine whether someone should be placed once they're eligible? See. Well, you'll, you'll have some. Uh, <laughs> so what are the supervision levels that a defendant can be subject to? 
Um, one, there's, and this is probably considered the lowest level of supervision, um, that is the DOC's telephonic monitoring system. My understanding is that it's sort of an automated system to remind defendants of court appearances and, and other important dates. Uh, there's also telephonic meetings with a assigned pretrial supervision officer, um, an in-person meeting with that individual, um, electronic monitoring, which um, is its own kind of standalone program that's being operated under the home detention, but is now being brought under this program as another form to supervise someone um, or any other means of contact deemed appropriate. So perhaps, you know, Zoom or FaceTime, that could be another another form of contact that uh, that's appropriate uh, as determined by DOC and the courts. So this would be under DOC. And this is what we're going to have to resolve <clears throat> is those pretrial supervision officers are DOC folks mm -hmm. that would be placed in your local p, &P offices across the state. So with 640,000, it's not going to cover 14, 13 or 14 areas. So that's what we'll have to make a decision on. What area would this program start up with? This is all under Department of Corrections. Mm -hmm. So it puts some pressure on the OC that they haven't experienced before. Now, could they absorb this position in some of the field offices? Possibly. Do they have to hire some folks for other field offices? Possibly. And that's what we have to wait for that. Topper? What's the difference between this position and a probation officer or a parole officer? Well, that's a good question that I might defer to the department to, to answer. Um, but from my perspective, I mean, this all happens before sentencing. You know, P a probation parole officer, that's after someone's gone through trial or pled out and um, they're either set and they're sentenced. So some of the, and this is what we can get into when I surprised, some of the, what we heard <clears throat> In my committee was there could already be someone mm -hmm. within the current PMP office, PMP officer that could take this role on. Some other field offices might not have that ability, so they'd have to hire someone. So that's what we'll have to get into when DOC comes up to the table. Um, so mo moving on, uh, the compliance and review procedure that I mentioned. So. Uh, one of the duties of the pretrial supervision officers is to notify the prosecutor and all reasonable efforts uh, to contact the defendant as well of any violations of court imposed program conditions committed by the defendant. So those would be the things that the court orders um, along with pretrial supervision that if those conditions are violated, the, the pretrial supervisor is obligated to inform the prosecutor of those violations. Um, but the officer has the discretion um, to report department imposed administrative committed conditions committed by the defendant. So um, I think that would be like, for instance, with electronic monitoring, if for whatever reason, the, the, the electronic monitor wasn't charged properly. I think that would be an example of an administrative condition that may have been violated, um, but it's discretionary on part of the officer. Um, and I, my understanding is that the rationale for that, as discussed in committee, is the officer has a relationship with the individual. If it's sort of a one-off thing, maybe they don't report it. But if it's a habitual occurrence, maybe then they have the discretion to report such a violation. And so it gives the officer that discretion based on their knowledge of the defendant. Um, and then also the parties of the court can move for the court to review their conditions. So they can be removed, they can be lessened, or they can be increased. Uh, <clears throat> quick short question uh, because I think maybe DOC will get into it later and that is what preparation the pretrial officers will be given in order to um, accomplish this as far as the training is concerned yeah. mm -hmm. um, I, I will defer to the department on that but but um, there are policies and procedures that need to be developed okay. I'll get into that a little bit um, and then finally with compliance and review uh, the prosecutor has the option also to file the pretrial supervision officer's sworn affidavit with the court to issue an arrest warrant for a defendant who 
fails to report to the officer altogether, commits multiple violations of supervision requirements, or absconds altogether. So um, that, that would be the situation where an arrest order, warrant can be requested upon submission of, of the officer's affidavit. Um, and so then there are various policies, procedures, and program support requirements. Uh, by the beginning of November of this year, GOC needs to establish written policies and procedures for the program to be used by the department and any of its contractors, um, but also for the courts to help understand how the program operates as well. Um, DOC must also develop policies and procedures uh, concerning the supervision levels um, and what the evidence-based criteria is for each level and the means of contact that's appropriate for each supervision level. Um, is electronic supervision permissible in this? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, that might not be the first thing mm -hmm. that they use. It could be just telephone monitoring mm -hmm. and say there's violations of that. They're not showing, they're not responding. Mm -hmm. um, they, no, we said that was the Right. Time. And yeah, so we're then we can escalate, I don't want to say escalate, but then the next step could be electronic monitoring. Mm -hmm. I think the key for electronic monitoring, I think folks will need to ask DOC what they can monitor. Right. Because that's really important. And I think any type of monitoring of electronic monitoring does not prevent someone from committing a crime. And the no location. It may know alcohol intake, possibly, but it does not prevent a person from committing another crime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really important to have that distinction. And the way this may all work in reality is that they, let's say they're just imposed that telephonic so the check-in system is imposed initially. If they just are completely ignoring it, mm -hmm. then those repeated violations may be reported by the prosecutor, by the, by the officer to the prosecutor. The prosecutor may move to the court. Okay, we need to review this defendant's conditions because they're not working right now. And so the prosecutor may then ask for an increased level of supervision or not, um, it's an opportunity for everybody to kind of come together before the court to kind of work out those issues okay. and potentially resolve the case too. So that was part of that was sort of part of my question. So um, does would the does it envision the court uh, a court process of revisiting um, to change the supervision? Requirement, so it's not like okay, well, DOC has all of has these four or five options available to them, um, and they can decide which one to use right. based on the circumstances. Each so the, the court would order a specific one of those supervision, and then if that needs to change, they have to go back to court. Correct. Okay. Um, and then, oh. why do we use the word term? I mean, the term may file discretionary. Okay. So they have the option to for those administrative conditions, but they're obligated to for the court imposed conditions to report them. So they report it happened. <laughs> I'm serious. Look but they may not uh, do the arrest warrant. Correct. The arrest warrant is really sort of like the ultimate backstop if they're completely ignoring everything and. Um, you know, they've either, they have multiple violations, they've left the jurisdiction altogether, um, or they just won't meet with their supervisor. So th that's that's an option available to the prosecutor, but it's not a, a requirement. And you know, currently right now, if someone is being supervised, either <clears throat> they could be on probation, they could be on furlough, even parole, if they're being supervised by DOC, there's discretion there as well from that field officer, from that PMP officer, whether to bring that back to the court, bring it back to DOC, or bring it back to the parole board. Because they build relationships with the folks that they're supervising, so they could tell if, oh, this is a one-off, or it's a perpetuation of a continued violation of conditions. So it does, right now, there is discretion. And within the committee discussion, there was sort of, there was a lot of talk about striking that balance of <clears throat> accountability, but also not overloading prosecutors, not overloading the courts, you know, where 
the prosecutor would have to, or the and DOC, where the DOC would have to report every little violation to the prosecutor. So you know there was that balance to give some discretion to perhaps the the more minor infractions, um, but then obligated the reporting of the court imposed. Um, and then finally, the program is contingent on funding. So if it's not funded, the courts aren't op, uh, cannot order it as a condition of release. And DOC can engage with any public entity to help with its uh, operations of the program. Um, so perhaps a local sheriff's department or a state uh, corrections department. Um, so again, as a reminder, the committee's task is to make recommendations on the use of funds <coughs> and the areas um, for the program to first be uh, brought on, on board. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions. Any other questions? Music. Music, please. Yeah. Anything else for Ben? Yeah. Just a quick one, Ben. Yeah. When you talked about uh, the monitoring of these individuals, uh, I, I believe in, in the Senate Judiciary there was a, a bit of a concern about uh, someone other than DOC doing the monitoring and a uh, not-for-profit entity monitoring the system. Right. I didn't see that on there. Has that changed? Has that been tweaked? So that was, that was taken out uh, during the legislative process that um, I believe that there was testimony, I want to say it was in the House, so that um, no one knew of any nonprofit entity that engages in this type of work, so they were struck. Um, that option, our ability for a nonprofit, was struck altogether. But there could be another entity, like the sheriff's department, or but we haven't. Correct. None of that has come to fruition. Yeah, there. the full discussion was, you know, the private entities wanted to be excluded from sort of the profiting concern with that, so a public entity was what was settled on. So to, for the next part of the testimony, I'm going to leave this up to the committee. Do you want to hear from the courts, or do you want to hear from DOC first? Does it matter? So I have a question. I mean, how, how much um, does it matter as far as the uh, court ability to address these things, as opposed to DOC, uh, as far as determining where this should happen? That's what um, we need to determine. Right. So, so I think we need to hear from both, but probably do. DOC I, first. Yeah, but I mean, just yeah, to understand the capacity of the court right. to deal with this issue in a particular county. Well, we have them both scheduled. I'm just saying, where do we, where do we, the committee like to go next? To the courts or DOC? I say DOC. I go for DOC. Okay. I vote for that too. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Ben. My pleasure. So I don't know from DOC's Al, are you coming up as I commissioner? <clears throat> Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. You're on the hot seat. For the record, Al Colmier, Chief of Operations with the Department of Correction. So you heard some of the questioning. Yes. Um, do you have any documents? Is this the only document? There's a policy that was uh, last night, I think. Bailey has it on a uh, slide deck that she's going to share here in a minute on the screen for folks okay. to see. So as what Ben stated, in order for this to occur within DOC, one of the processes for DOC, they have a lot of policies and procedures. And this is all done internally within the department to carry out um, initiatives or procedures that the department carries out. And they have a whole slew of policies and procedures for everything that they do. So this is new. This is new, yeah. And it was put out, has it been formally adopted? It has not. Okay. We wanted to share this draft with, with the committee before we move forward with, with any implementation efforts. Um, as we discussed earlier, we need to determine the, the site for this, the, the pilot site, uh, understanding that the funding that was allocated for us is not enough to, 
implement this statewide, the five positions that we were allocated. Um, while we have been authorized those positions, we've not seen those positions yet. Those are still in classification with the Department of Human Resources. I don't have a timeline on when we may receive those positions, hopefully by the end of the year, but um, before we do have those positions, we won't be able to move forward. We've been working closely with our Newport Probation and Parole Office as the potential pilot site for this program, um, utilizing both Essex and Orleans counties. Um, we have a, a very good relationship in the, in the Essex and Orleans area with the AGO's pretrial monitoring program. Um, we work closely with them. Um, we've been discussing kind of a handoff with that program to ensure that we're not duplicating services, that there's a smooth handoff of services. Um, the pretrial monitoring is more recommendation and volunteer where this would be a mandated program. Um, we've worked closely with the Vermont Department of Health, Division of Substance Use on uh, referrals for designated agencies and treatment providers within the Essex and Orleans area um, for any treatment opportunities that are conditions that may be imposed by the court or the local PMP office. Um, so there, there's been a lot of work going on uh, in, the, in the background in, in coordination with developing this, this policy with our internal group. So, um, so given that um, there's insufficient funds to implement this statewide, and you talked about working with Newport, um, are there any other places in the state that you would prioritize for inclusion in, you know, what might be a pilot? I, I think if we were to expand, I, I would I would look at Caledonia County initially just to kind of keep it in in that general area. Mm -hmm. As as the chair stated, you know this is new for us. This we've we've not historically done anything pretrial. We're we're great at supervision, but pretrial supervision is a different different program for us. And nationally, state agencies of corrections don't do pretrial. Those are locally operated by courts and counties. Um, and where we don't have the county system where, you know, this, this puts us in a, in a new realm for us. So um, part of the question, I, I think one of the other questions was on what is the, the training component and the, the title. Um, our intent is to use probation and parole officers. It's an existing job class. We wouldn't have to create a new job class. Um, they're familiar with risk assessments. They refer uh, referral processes to treatment providers. Um, they, they know the work. Um, we just don't have the you know the statutory authority for return to custody arrest and, and so forth. <clears throat> but the uh, the report writing and the, the risk assessments that we use uh, those staff are very familiar with that already. So I mean in the in the enacting legislation it you know used the term first implement so it, it seemed to indicate that it, it wasn't necessarily intent to be able to do it statewide in the first year. Right. And so is it the department's recommendation that we uh, contain it? Um, it sounds like what you're saying is to contain it within the Northeast Kingdom. Yes, yeah, so our, our proposal is to, to utilize uh, uh, the Newport Probation and Parole Office with, with both the Essex and Orleans County Courts to start this program for us to kind of get it off the ground and, and work out the, the pain points and, and push this forward so that we can be successful with it. Yeah. So I'm thinking about the, um, the folks who would be uh, put into the program uh, who are the pretrial, in pretrial. And what data do we have from that part of the state? So what types of crimes are you looking at or frequency of crimes are you looking at in that area that really sort of provides the evidence to, um, to contain it to the Newport, Essex, Orleans area? So our, our staff in that office have worked closely with Judge Tebow up there, the state's attorney's office. They've reviewed the cases. Um, we're, we're, you know, it's a smaller number, certainly. It's a smaller, smaller uh, court. But we're seeing, you know, initially 10 to 12 cases to, to start this off that, that would be eligible. We're Are these retail theft cases? I don't know the charge no. off the top of my head. Okay. I could get that information. But, um, I'm just trying to sort out where what are the what are the most predominant types of um, cases and violations that might suggest that we use this to to lower that number 
what we what we've looked at is is the criteria outlined in the, the legislative language. It's around the the five viol five or more yeah. charges or um, the violation of conditions, existing violation of conditions. Okay, and then my other question is with regard to the use of probation and parole officers. You say it'll be only ten or twelve um, cases that would be assigned. Uh, and I do understand that some of our probation and parole officers are oversubscribed. The caseload is huge. So adding 10 or 12 in an area where there are fewer uh, offers an opportunity to look at how probation and parole officers do with this new educational piece. Um, it, will it, it, does it give us, uh, demonstrate what would happen if we had to hire someone new? Uh, up front to do the work. So will it give us that information going forward? Yes, I mean, we're, so we're, we're statutorily mandated on our caseload sizes. So with, with the, the, the current existing uh, PMP offices and those caseloads are statutorily limited. So we understand that. We know we don't want to burden the, the existing staff with an, an additional program that's outside of the realm of the, the normal work. Um, but I think to, to your question is like, how do we how do we measure that? Is how do we measure it, and how do we measure it against someone who comes into the program new, a new supervisor, um, and how do we know that that can be effective, and who who we hire for that? Well, I, I think to to my earlier point with the, the work that we do, I mean, we 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 do know supervision, and and we know the risk assessments, we know the interaction, we know how to communicate effectively. Um, we have existing relationships with the courts and with um, the, the state's attorneys and the public defenders in those in those areas, and it's building upon those those relationships with the new staff as well, and bringing them into into the office, setting them up for success, just like we would set up. The individuals that were supervising for success, hopefully, um, but the, the training components all revolve around the the assessments that we would use. The uh, what we will see. I saw the Ohio assessment. Yes, the, the Ohio risk assessment screens. Yes, um, there's a pretrial component that we use that normally for for our population now. But there's a pretrial specific pretrial assessment tool that we would implement as part of this program. Um, you know, some of the, the discussions we've had with our internal committee is, is around like a, a focus group, like uh, nobody that's on pre, uh, an area where there is no pretrial and an area where there is and comparing the cases around success rates. Um, before we expanded that, that statewide to see, is it really that effective? Because we don't know. Um, and and that's, that's something that we're, we're discussing internally at this point. So Al, within the PMP office up there in the Newport facility, Newport area, are you going to absorb this? Is the proposal to absorb it with your current staff there, or are you going to have to hire someone? We would hire somebody. Would it be one person? One person at this point, yes. And what other costs would be involved with this? For so a, a lot of it. In that area. The, uh, so the... The, the staffing costs, obviously, the, the, the salary and benefits is, is a big piece, which is where the, the five positions and the 640000 are allocated. That leaves very little room for, for anything additional, which could be the cost associated with additional electronic monitoring, um, the, the telephone monitoring. We do have a, a meeting today with Fieldware, which is the company that provides the telephone monitoring software. They have expanded capabilities and technologies now with cell phone check-ins. I know that, that Ben had talked about, you know, potentially FaceTime, Zoom. Um, so check-ins through text messages, through location sharing with, with the cell phone and, and increased monitoring efforts there. So we'll be talking with them today. Um, but, but the initial cost, I think it, it's really the salary and benefit component of it and any potential increase in, um, in the electronic monitoring fees. Should we expand this and we see an increased number, those costs could increase uh, with the need for an additional vehicle for staff for, for field supervision purposes, um, you know, equipment for the, the new staff, laptops, computer, um, uniform, any, anything like that. Um, but that's, that's where we would be looking at the, the cost at this point. Do you have a budget? 
We have we have submitted a, we've submitted a budget early in the legislative session last year on what the cost would be to, mm -hmm. to implement that statewide, yeah. and that is broken down. On the same uh, one. Yes. Yeah. So there's a six hundred thousand plus. So what you're proposing for just this one area? would not use up all of the six. It, it certainly would not. And and that would give us the room for expansion. Should we should we need to roll that out or into uh, the representative question on what where would the next potential area be? Um, it's really the staffing costs at this point because we would have to have the staff to do that. So maybe the question before us, do we just recommend just one place, which would be the Newport? Mm -hmm. or knowing that there's five positions that have been approved, though they haven't come online, they've been allocated, yeah. but they haven't come online. The money is in the budget for FY25. Do we, what's before the committee, I would think, do we just start with one out of the Newport, or do we make a recommendation and say, start up with two right off? That's what is before us that we could make a recommendation. So, so I just have a question and, and uh, whether the charged individuals, the people who will be dealt with in the Northeast Kingdom and Essex and Orleans, are they comparable? Do they have the comparable issues uh, as those in more, um, I don't well, think I'd call any place metropolitan <laughs> in Vermont, you mean but in, County? yeah, in Chittenden <laughs> County or, or well, uh, Rutland, County. those areas. I mean, are, are, are they facing the same issues? So are we going to really learn how well this is working or might work for <clears throat> Rutland or, or Burlington by what's going on there? Yeah, I, I think we are seeing a lot of the same issues in those areas across the state and, and within each of our probation and parole offices. And I think one of the things that that really hinders the the people showing up to court is transportation, and that's something that we can you know work with those folks on is like using connecting them with RCT to get to court uh, and and areas like that. It's really it's about helping these people succeed, right? We talked about the the purpose and the intent is is the intent a stick or a carrot? We're hoping it's more of a carrot to encourage the folks to get to court to be there to assist them in finding resources to give them. What, what they need to, to show up for court and, and be successful in that. Um, so I, I think to that point, and, and a lot of the charges we see in those areas are very similar with drug-related crimes, assaults, aggravated assault, I mean, that, that kind of criminal history. Um, just related to uh, Martin's question, um, so on a per capita basis, the Northeast Kingdom is high in terms of substance use and substance use crimes. Um, so, um, it also um, makes me wonder about, you know, to what extent will these staff positions be able to assist individuals in connecting, for instance, with treatment or with, um, you know, follow-up services like, you know, you mentioned the designated agencies and uh, mental health supports and, um, you know, I hesitate to call them case managers or service coordinators, but um, uh, lots of times that's kind of what these folks uh really need in terms of um, somebody who's going to be there kind of on an ongoing basis. Yeah, that, and that's part of our intent in, in creating these positions and the work and a smaller caseload is to ensure that that, that those services are available. Mm -hmm. um, our work with DSU has has started, you know, those discussions and those partnerships. We work closely with them in, in all of our state buildings, but um, specifically for this pilot in, in Newport and, and looking at what resources are available so that we've we've got the relationship with um, with DSU and, and the service providers that they have in that area mm -hmm. to ensure mm -hmm. that those those connections are made. Yeah. And as you know, I mean, I think as we sort of move through this and think about this, I mean, one of the things we might think about is whether um, there would be benefit in allocating maybe at least one of those positions as a service coordinator or case manager type of position. Is it, um, sometimes there might be a difference of um, approach um, between a probation and parole officer and um, it, just even the title. Yeah, right, <laughs> um, right. And, you know, thinking about somebody who um, uh, might have a a different role in that and maybe one of those positions might be beneficial in thinking about it from that but you know i realize this is all just getting started and 
And certainly we don't want to replicate things that already exist, but you know, I know. And that's, sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say, and I, but I know both in the DSU system and the substance use system and in the mental health systems, they're lacking in staff as well. So, that, yes. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, we've, we've had those conversations. We've also had pretty in-depth conversations with the pretrial monitoring program. Um, and again, to not duplicate services, but to ensure a handoff and, and help, <clears throat> help that team succeed as well. Um, you know, I think in, in our conversations with them, a lot of their frustration is they haven't had the accountability tool mm -hmm. where we will be able to provide that and hopefully see greater success. Mm -hmm. But I, I think we're, even though the, the title, the working title, probation and parole officer, it's just easier from a classification standpoint, not having to create an additional mm -hmm. position through that process. Um, but the, the, the training component and the work is certainly different. And the work of a probation and parole officer is certainly different than it was 15 years ago when I was a probation and parole officer. Mm -hmm. and, and it really is more about the service oriented work and, and getting finding people doing things good, not finding them doing things bad um, and, and helping them succeed. So that's that's really the goal with these with these staff in this program. Martin, Jenny, and then I So uh, I guess uh, um, I'd like to see the, the conversation change a little bit from the concept of pilot, which I don't think the legislation actually says pilot. It does say it's subject to the amount of money. I mean, I would like to understand or see what a rollout plan is. And if uh, Essex and Orleans is the first step, great. But rather than having to revisit to see our, how it's working, let's assume that we've got our ducks in a row. And what is the rollout? rollout? What's the next uh, stage for this, which will also help presumably in any budget request to start gearing it up for fiscal year 26. Uh, that would be, I don't know if that's something you've folks have considered if you have a rollout plan and if not, you know, if that's something that could be doable. It's certainly something we can do. Uh, we do not have one at this point. I mean, our, our focus has been on standing up this, the small program in, in, in the Newport area. Um, but we can certainly go back to, to the office and start working on a rollout plan and, and see where it would fit best across the state and, and what that what that would look like. All right, and that that could take advantage of what we already have in there in the budget to, for that next step, mm -hmm. hopefully happening in twenty five. Yeah. So, but. yeah, we can certainly do that. Yeah, I guess that would that that's similar to the question or the comment I was going to make. It would be helpful to know how this is all going to work. And um, maybe when we go through this, we'll get an idea of it. This isn't. This is an outline. Right. Thinking the draft policy. Yeah, so it's just draft. Um, but and going back to your questions, that you've indicated that Newport demonstrates very similar crimes and pretrial issues with other parts of the state, including more populated parts of the states like Rutland, or Brattleboro, or Burlington. Um, so it, it would be helpful to understand how this program is going to roll out to support folks in those, um, in those areas, with or without transportation. Mm -hmm. I think we all know transportation is ungodly in the rural parts of the state, but so maybe it would, be good to mm -hmm. we can start, yeah we can go through the policy and then probably answer yeah. some of those questions we have one more question i think thank you manager um i wrote down five people salary and benefits is i guess what that's six hundred plus thousand dollars to recover and then i heard the chair speak about one or two people and i'm just wondering if one or two people can cover the 24 7 monitoring or is it not 24 7 and i'm just trying to reconcile those numbers you mean the electronic monitoring or or decision in general, I'm not. Yeah. So it's, it, it would not. It's it's not 24/7. It's not. You know, obviously, okay. we are a 24/7 agency, and should something come to our attention in the middle of the night, we would certainly respond. But it's not an active monitoring system, and okay. we we have capabilities of, of active and passive. We we choose the passive monitoring component where staff come in the next day and look at the data and waypoints where where somebody may have been and so forth but um it, it goes to the earlier discussion that it's not an immediate response to to violation behavior it would be a day after the fact 24 to 48 hours depending on when we when we see that data um even the, the telephone monitoring system it's it's 
calling and leaving a voicemail basically to there's canned questions that are asked that would be relative to pretrial supervision that we would develop with the, with the provider. Those questions would be, have you made your court date? Have you talked with your attorney? Have you engaged in treatment? And yes, no questions. And then we filter through those and, and monitor those. So that's, that's what that would look like. So are you okay with one or two people or is five ideal, but you don't know? Well, I, five, I think, five I, I think five is we expand the program, but I think to, to start, you know, we would be, I, I think we, we feel that we can, we can do this with us in a new port at this time. Um, and then expand from there. And I get to the earlier question about the rollout plan. We could certainly highlight a lot of that in the, in that, in that plan. Chopper? Um, <clears throat> help me understand something. Because as I listen, I, all I'm thinking about is an existing parole officer. Um, you're planning to hire somebody new in Newport. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And that person is going to be trained? Yes. Now, what is the... In here, it talks about a parole officer or a probation officer. What? What's the difference between those two? There, there is no the person you're going to hire yeah. and somebody that's there. So it's it's a training component, right? And I, I think if we go to the working title of, of the <clears throat> position, we have we have a, a position title that's. So you're going to have a different job description for this person. The, the working title would be different than the actual. We're, we're going to hire a probation and parole officer because it's an existing job class within the DHR classification okay. system. Pay rate comparable to all the, the other PPOs that, that we have. Working <laughs> title would be pretrial supervision officer. And they're going to be doing different things. Yes. And the probation parole also yeah. do. Very similar, but different in, in regards to risk assessments, referrals to, to programs, to treatment, um, accountability, phone calls, the office visits. They're very similar work, but without the uh, without the statutory authority to return somebody to custody should they be violating their conditions. Okay. Um are you going to, would you hire uh, somebody that's already in the office? Potentially. The parole officer? Potentially. And then the new person that you hire would take that other person's job? Well, we, if we. I'm trying to figure out how this thing is going to work in the local office. Yeah. So we, I mean, we would, we've, we would recruit. A, a new position. If it's somebody that's interested, if, if it's a, a current probation and parole officer that would be interested in doing this kind of work, depend, you know, they, they could be a fresh college graduate, yeah. human services background, or this is right up their, their alley. Um, you know, we would certainly consider that person. And then we would fill for the probation and parole officer, another we would recruit for that. Um, we, we recruit pretty consistently across the state with, with those positions. Um, and if it's a backfill position where we we would take from from uh, the local office okay. for this role, then we would we would hire for the specific probation and parole office. So that's a good segue into now. If you could just quickly go through what is being proposed for your policy. So the the policy really is an overview of of how we would implement and. In the department, a free trial provision program. Um, the second page two uh, talks about the referral process. Uh, ben kind of touched on this in, in his presentation um, around the eligibility for the uh, violation of conditions or five or more pending court dockets. Uh, additional criteria that, that we would be looking for that the person would have to be a resident of Vermont with a Vermont address. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to supervise somebody in another other state or jurisdiction. Um, there's no detainers, warrants, or holds. Um, that would require the individual to be incarcerated. Um, it's not currently under any form of community supervision. <clears throat> that the services would be redundant as we're already supervising the, the person and would hopefully already be aware of any pending charges. Um, and that they have the ability to make phone calls to the, the telephone reporting system. Uh, and the ability to report to the, the office when required to do so. Uh, if they don't make, meet that criteria after the referral from the court, then we would notify the court as, as part of our reporting structure 
that, that they would not be eligible to participate. Um, if they meet the criteria, we conduct the Ohio risk assessment, the pretrial supervision. You'll see on page three, there's a, a graph um, based on the, the Ohio risk assessment. Um, so we've got the offense level, uh, whether or not. Yeah, quick question on page two. Yep. I apologize. <clears throat> so I guess I'm troubled, and, and I understand the way this is set up uh -huh. uh, with telephone reporting and the like, but um, individuals who are homeless and uh, don't have access to phone, uh, a phone, uh, from my understanding, often can be the folks that probably need the most help in mm -hmm. complying. And, and if there can be consideration, maybe not initially, but of, of how that population can be served uh, with the supervision program. Yeah, we can certainly look at that to see if there are any programs, maybe through economic services that provide phone or something like that. Right, thanks. I've got a, I've got a quick question. Uh -huh. Yes, if you can just back up to page one. Sorry, we're just. I hear this all the time. I just need you to elaborate briefly on using evidence-based strategy. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? So evidence-based evidence, evidence -based strategies would be utilizing uh, data and successful program information from other areas. So like my, myself and one of the uh, supervisors from Newport attended a uh, training seminar in Indiana with Indiana County that's, that's doing pre-trial pre supervision and their success rate and how they've implemented that program to reduce their jail incarceration of detainees um, success rate. So that's those are models that we're looking at where there's evidence there that shows this, this program has been successful in, an, in another area. And we can take that evidence that they've provided us and incorporate it into our practices. Okay, thank you. Go back to the, the grid, I think. Any other questions before the grid? Um, so you, you'll see here we we have three levels of, of super. So let me just quickly, sorry to do this to you. <laughs> Going back to page two, where you have um, really put in place as an outline assign probation and par parole officers. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it becomes fail complete that regardless of where this is in the state, we'll be starting out with probation and parole officers. Why not also have a phrase in there that says, or other trained supervisor, so that um, going forward, there are options for folks, regardless of where they are. I think we can look at that working title. Yeah, okay. Component of a word. Just to make it more consistent. Yeah. Yeah, we could call, we would reference our supervision officers. Uh, so the, the grid, we have, we have three levels of supervision, level one, two, and three. Those are based on both the score of the ORAS and the charge that the individual is pending. Uh, so non-violent misdemeanor with a high risk score would be at, at level two. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, the supervision levels are further down. Uh, the, where are we? Page five. Um, you can see the, the supervision level is highlighted in section C. Uh, individuals with a level of one will be monitored through the telephone reporting system. Individuals with level two will be monitored through the, the telephone system and two calls from there are assigned an officer per month. And then level three would be the telephone reporting, one call from the PO per week, and one required in-person office visit per month. Um, well, for the risk level, does that look at the severity of the crime as well as the risk and yes, that's all part of the, the risk assessment tool. Actually include the risk of uh, not showing up or 
flight. Risk of flight, criminal history, yep, that's all taken into account as part of the assessment tool. And we can certainly share that tool with the committee if you'd like to see that too. Then you really get in the weeds. Yeah. So, so if, uh, I'm on the other end of the phone and I'm in the pre trial situation and you would ask me, did you go see the doctor today? And I'd say, yes. How was that? This is very good. I love it. It's great. Does anybody check to see if I went to the doctor? How do you do that? Well, I mean, there, there would need to be releases in place. And I mean, I, I depending on the situation, I, if, if we said substance abuse counselor instead of medical doctor, right? Maybe it's a, a substance abuse issue that we're looking at. Yeah. Then we, we could. We would have part of the intake with this individual, release of information signed from the treatment provider that they may be um, engaged with. And then we would have that ability to talk with that person to say, you know, we just want to make sure, yeah. verify that this person's showing up and they, with that release, we would be able you to do that. that. Yeah. And it's going to be part of the Yeah. The yep. And, and our, our POs do that now. Okay. Yep. So, Al, that raises a question that yep. I've been hesitant to ask about this. <clears throat> HIPAA. Yes. Has popped its ugly head up in some places, particularly in my community. Mm -hmm. um, because we'll be working with our other providers there to release information. But it is up to the defendant to voluntarily sign right. those release of information forms. Right. So if that doesn't get done, information cannot be released Correct. back and forth. How often does that occur? It's it's rare, honestly. It's, I mean, the release of information forms are not signed. Are not signed, yes. That's a, that's an issue that it, it relates is. out there. It, it is, and 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 if that was something that that occurred with this, we would certainly refer that back to the court, mm -hmm. saying that we're unable to verify their compliance with program requirements. So that that person wouldn't be eligible, right? Potentially not, right? Okay. okay. So let's go back to page three here, mm -hmm. and why don't you walk us quickly through? So this is the, the referral and the, and the report. So we would determine the eligibility risk assessment who will be completed. The EOC would have 10 days to, um, within 10 days of the receipt of the referral, the report will be returned to the court with a recommendation of whether the candidate is appropriate, um, that they meet the, the criteria in subsection two of this section. Um, if the defendant does not meet the criteria, would not recommend them and the reasons why they would not be recommended, whether that's their refusal to sign a, a release form, um, whether they're, you know, risk of flight, whatever, whatever it could, could potentially be, not a resident of, of Vermont. Um, we would include the, the supervision level. Um, part of this in, in here, the request for the assigned PPO to be named a party of the case, this is so that we could get the updates from the court system um, on new court dates, any changes, any uh, status conferences that are scheduled and so forth, that the, the PPO is aware of that. Um, so you wouldn't automatically receive that unless you were party to the case? Correct. Is that kind of being party to the case, having, the, having that probation officer being named uh, party to the case, is that going to give that officer more authority or control than they would normally have? Not so much authority or control, but information, just the, the knowledge of when somebody should be reporting to court, any change that allows them to, to make a phone call to say to the individual, hey, so your, your change of plea was changed or, you know, you have a status conference scheduled, just want to make sure you got that information so that you can show up. Uh, it's really sharing, being informed so that we can share that. And again, part of the ensuring success in the in the program. Do your usual PMC officers um, 
party? Are they usually parties to the? It, it depends on the case. Not in it, not initially because they're not under our care and custody. Violation of condition or you know a violation of probation, they could potentially be named in that um, and then be updated on that information. But that would be a question for for the judiciary on the best way to do that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so then part of the uh, the report would go into recommended conditions of supervision, um, including uh, the, any change in residence, the reporting is directed, complying with the, the telephone monitoring. We then go into the uh, intake process, what that would look like, which is no different than, than a, a normal intake at, at any of our, our field sites. Face sheet, photograph, get the individual entered into our offender management system. Review the court orders, conditions of supervision, any agreements as required by the court. Um, orientation to ADA. Information around you know, the, the local office and who to contact in case of emergency. Creating all that documentation. So what you've listed out here in one and two is what currently occurs when someone is being supervised. As an intake. As an intake. Yeah. Yeah. This is pretty, tracks. Pretty standard, yeah. Is there any addition here uh, that would not be in a normal intake that you do now? <laughs> No, pretty similar across the board. So, so is there anything about the maybe I just didn't see it about medical status or somebody's on medic? Uh, MAT, thank you. MAT, yeah. Uh, well, th that would be part of the intake. I mean, part of the questions that we would we would normally ask. And this is a very broad overview, but we would get into that like treatment. Providers, if they're okay. if they're taking any medication, um, talk about the release. That's something we can certainly add in there if needed. But part of the, the regular intake. On page five, we do go over C, mm -hmm. and then we have D, E, and F. Yeah, so the case reviews. Uh, Can, just before you move off from C, um, so I, I remember us talking about this earlier, and just was wondering if you were going to suggest or modify this to include video conferencing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, if, if, if that technology becomes available to us after, we, we would certainly add that in there. Well, it seems like it could be an or. Yeah. Can, The, uh, on, on D, we move into the case review. Um, the PPO will review the case every 90 days, provide an update to the court on that review regarding the defendant's compliance or lack thereof. Um, if they are compliant with the program, we can consider removing them from the pretrial supervision program or lowering the defendant's level of supervision depending on, on their compliance with, with the conditions that had been imposed. If we're seeing somebody that is successful and then and, and does not need the hand holding or you know the, the push to get them where they need to be um, is is registering compliance with us, we we would make that recommendation that they may no longer need to be on supervision before their case. Again, moving on to the violation behavior. Um, <clears throat> if there's any condition violated, we would notify the court of that violation. Board of State's attorneys submit the sworn affidavit. All back to the response. Then the, the completion component is that they've been removed by the court, been sentenced on all dockets associated with the, the trial, or have had their supervision revoked by the court. So this is an internal 
hmm. policies and procedures yeah. in the Department of DOC. What is the public process? You said this is the first draft mm -hmm. that has not been approved <clears throat> by DOC. Right. Is there a public process between now and when you when DOC signs off? We do have a public comment period. We have an internal comment period. We have shared this with the judiciary. I know that, that Judge Bilnay has, has seen this policy. Um, so yeah, we're, I mean, we're ready to move that forward and, and be ready to go for, for the November 1st or whatever what they need. And how would the average public or organizations know that this was being proposed and there was time for public comment? It's on our website. So people would have to go to the website, have to know to go to the website. Questions? That's I, yeah, I won't I won't raise the whole <laughs> internal issue and lack of regulation at that process. So overall it looks like it's a good start. Um and it, it, it'll it help folks uh, move ahead, You help you move ahead a little bit. Um, I do have some comments to make as you're going forward with more detailed um, policy and process. Mm -hmm. And so first of all, the, the comment earlier about ensuring it's not just probation and parole officer trying to think statewide, it's a supervisor, could be somebody new. And then what are the what what's the goal of this? The goal is to keep folks in the in the pretrial environment from committing another crime and staying out of DOC, staying out of the judiciary. So it, as the educational piece goes forward, it will be important to have some something in that that helps the supervisor provide information for the the individual who's been charged to keep them from committing another crime and then, um, or meeting their court dates or whatever it is. So a supportive environment. Uh, so everything that's here is making sure that they adhere to the requirements, but also to have that supportive environment going forward. Uh, so the educational piece for the supervisor will be key. And I think, um, and I think our probation and parole officers probably understand that. Um, and then the minor detail, the contact versus the call. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking of providing a cell phone for folks and it works to have the call, but if not, then somehow, I think someone else brought that up earlier, but I'm just trying to. So I look forward to the more detailed information and hearing from the courts, their thoughts as well. Thank you. So we do have a question on Zoom, Nader, and then Topper. Let's go to Nader first. Welcome, Nader. Hi. Sorry I uh, wasn't able to make it there in person today. Um, and also, I apologize for missing the first uh, 45 minutes or so of the meeting. But um, I, I, I do have one question about the violations. And perhaps this was covered at the very beginning, so I apologize if it was. But if someone were to violate uh, a condition of their supervision, I mean, what would what would the result be for them? I mean, would it be comparable to a violation of probation or, I mean, is it is it something different? That I was wondering if I could get some more clarity on that. I think that would be at the discretion of the, of the, the court and the, the state's attorney. We would make the referral for violation behavior, but we would not impose the violation. I, I would anticipate it would probably be a violation of conditions of release, depending on what the, the behavior is. Thank you. Um, I'm just follow up on Senator's comments. Um, I think it's important that you distinguish between what this person is and what the probation and parole officer is. Because I, 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 I'm okay with it now, I understand. But I don't think the general public or or maybe people in the office might not know. Yeah, we <laughs> because it, it's at least when I read this, it's tied to probation parole, and it's something entirely different from that. Right, because they're not sentenced. Yeah, Correct. but you could have, depending on the caseload, depending on the staff of the particular field office, 
wherever that may be, regardless of how we first roll it out, if it becomes statewide at some point, you could have a PMP officer take this role on as well. Potentially. Correct? Potentially. It just would be the training and what is the difference there. Sure. And I heard you refer to a working title yes. as well, which sort of like, you know, I, I get what he's talking about, right. I mean, creating a whole new class and, mm -hmm. and that takes a lot longer. Yes. All of that kind of stuff. So, you know, working titles within the office will say something. Yeah, and, and we can we can certainly adjust that within yeah. within this document. And, and we, we specifically worked on what to call the folks and it's the pretrial supervision officer, you know, making it distinguishable from the role of probation officer. So any other questions from DO for DOC before we move on? Sure. Thank you, Al. Thank you. Um, I know that we have Tim Dumont here for state's attorney. I know you'll have to leave at 1130. Is there anything you want to share with us at all, or you're good to go? Thank you. 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 Should be available. I think. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Tom Zone, Chief Superior Judge. So, as far as the the court's position, uh, I know that DOC has included the judges of, who would be affected. And that would be the Orleans and the Essex judge. And so, Judge Tebow as well as Judge Kane and were involved with the DOC representatives uh, throughout the process of discussing what would it possibly look like in that area and how to be implemented. This includes uh, review and input into the policy that DOC has uh, provided to the committee here today. As far as you know, the court's position, the legislature has enacted a statute that requires DOC to go forward with its pretrial supervision program. What DOC has put together so far is in furtherance of that. And where they've included us, we will do what we need to do to make it succeed. Uh, for what the court can offer. Uh, Senator Lyons asked the question early on about the, the types of cases. Well, as Ben explained at the introduction today on the statute, there's two ways that you can get into the program. One is if you have a violation of conditions of release, which can be a single charge, as well as if you have five or more separate dockets open. If I did my math right, currently there are 1,549 cases pending in Orleans County. It looks like 912 of those involve violations of conditions. Of the 912, 329 involve five or more cases for 33 defendants. And so basically, you have quite a few individuals who would qualify sitting here today for this program. So when I hear the number 12, <laughs> as 12 people coming in, you have a significant larger number of people who may qualify and may benefit from the program. In terms of how the program would go forward, uh, the court would make the time to be able to handle it because this does add to the court an obligation. Once there's a request made for the review, we then, when we receive the report from the Department of Corrections, have to have a hearing. That's a hearing that does not currently exist, nor is it a hearing that uh, the court would normally schedule in a case. And so that's another hearing that we have to hold. Ideally, by holding that hearing and putting an individual into the program, if that's the decision, will mitigate the potential for further hearings on violations of conditions or other criminal conduct that could be alleged. And so the, my thought is that by doing this program, yes, it adds something to what we need to do as far as court hearings and procedures, but also the net benefit will hopefully be reducing uh, another level of what's coming in so that we don't have that 912 number for VCRs and that is sig significantly less in the future. Uh, and Senator Hashim asked a question about what happens when there's a violation. The way that this is structured, as Ben explained, is the legislature this past session amended 13 BSA section 7554 and that's the statute on conditions of release. It added a provision in there that as a condition of release, the court has the ability to 
uh, put someone in this program, the pretrial supervision program. Accordingly, if someone violates it, the potential under the way the program is put together in the statute would be that the state's attorney is notified. The state's attorney then would have the option of whether or not that the state is going to file a violation of conditions. And then once that's filed, the court would have to determine if it does meet the criteria to establish a violation of conditions. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that members of the committee may have. So you answered one of my questions, Judge. Thank you that I was um, thinking about in terms of like, what's what's the universe of potentially eligible individuals uh, and what would the caseload potentially look like? And so I guess one of the questions that I have is that I can foresee that, um, you know, whether it's defense attorneys or the individual themselves or the Department of Corrections or whatever, I, I can see that there is the potential to exceed the capacity in relatively short order of the ability to handle the number of cases that potentially could come in under this um, element of um, of sentence or not sentence and pre trial, um, and, and what are your thoughts about? Um, so the concern I have, I'm trying to get to, is uh, then it it seems as though if there's um, insufficient resources to be able to meet the demand, then it sort of sets up an equity issue um, even before you get to trial. Um, because uh, not, not necessarily um, all individuals might not have access to something that um, these resources that, you know, I guess should be available to anybody who meets the qualifications. Senator Sears used to always talk about geographic justice. Yeah. And this actually, what we're talking uh, here today, you're, you're talking about, a, it's referred to as a pilot project, but that's not what the statute said. The right, statute right. said it was for everywhere. And so I think like with many statutes, there may be times where a certain geographic area gets something that other areas don't because that's just necessary. And in doing that, it, you look at it from a, a need perspective mm -hmm. and the ability of the stakeholders to have the resources to achieve success there. Mm -hmm. And so DOC came up with the idea that the best place to start this, as I understand it, would be the Newport area. When we now zero in a little bit further, yes, there will be individuals who would possibly benefit from this program that won't be able to get in it right away. And I think Al mentioned uh, that you know, Judge Tebow, who is the presiding criminal judge there, has been part of these discussions. Mm -hmm. And for instance, as we're sitting here now, I, I have in front of me a chart of every defendant who has five or more cases in Orleans County. And Judge Tebow, I know, reviews these charts. Mm -hmm. And so Judge Tebow, state's attorney, the defense bar, would have the opportunity to look and say, who's going to benefit the most? Mm -hmm. And so, yes, there may be difficult choices initially. And ideally, we get to a point where we're able to expand it, whether it's just in uh, Orleans County, Essex County, or throughout the state to address those types of issues. But initially, yes, there will be areas that by necessity, we're not gonna be able to serve everyone. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And do you have any thoughts about, um, Al also said that uh, in other states, it's not normally the Department of Corrections that administers such a program. Do you have any thoughts about, uh, about the Department of Corrections in particular administering a, a pre-trial program? Yes. And what might they be? <laughs> uh, in Vermont, the way our structure is, that's that's the place that the legislature saw that it was most appropriate to have it fit into, and that's what the statutory scheme was. Uh, the state of Illinois Supreme Court just created an entire pretrial system uh, for pretrial services in 2021. Mm -hmm. And uh, some counties were doing it on their own. In some jurisdictions, they do things on their own, each by as was mentioned, county to county. We don't have a state where that type of structure has been historically something that worked. And so right now, uh, it would seem that if you're looking for an organization that is part of supervision, the structure would be the Department of Corrections mm -hmm. because they are supervising, supervising individuals. Yes, it's currently after uh, conviction, but this kind of transition, it, it's a more natural fit. We don't have a resource like that in the judiciary for that mm -hmm. type of supervision that would be able to address that. Thank you. 
So I have some more questions, Jenny, and then Martin. So when you brought up the 912, that, that struck a note uh, about geographic equity. Uh, we have 600 and something thousand dollars to invest in a statewide program. Then the question arises, do we cover all of Essex, Orleans, and Newport? We cover all of that first and then move to the rest of the state? Or does this committee make a decision about having something happen in each county before um, we use up all the dollars, you know. So how is that? I think that's a committee a committee decision about uh, how quickly and how far and where to move. Uh, because the nine hundred twelve is a big number, and I'm sure it was a big number wherever we look in the state. You will. Uh, for instance, there are twelve thousand three hundred and seventy five current violation of condition cases pending in the state today. Mm -hmm. Cool. So if I can interject here a little bit and shift to corrections in terms of testimony that was given on what the real cost of this would be if it was rolled out to all areas of the state. It's a lot more than 640,000. Yes. Yeah, so Commissioner yeah. or Al, we, we just testified in something. the legislature last session mm -hmm. that in order to, in our estimation, in order to effectively run a statewide program, you would require 14 additional staff beyond what we have right now. Um, I think the revised estimates on the cost there is that's about three and a half million dollars. So you figure each position that we add is about $150,000. Oh, what? 150 when you factor in salary, fringe, and benefits. In addition to the electronic monitoring equipment, any equipment officers need, uh, any other programs that we roll out, subscriptions to services that we have. Um, and we offered that up to the legislature last year. The legislature said, well, we'll give you five positions and $600,000. Uh, that, that's not a, a pool of resources that we can effectively run a state of and that's why. So we even decided that we yeah. only want to run it in Newport. We decided we only have the resources to run it in one jurisdiction. So no, but what you're you're raising a really interesting point, and uh, this whole program is a program of prevention. So we're what we're looking at are initial investments, but we're also looking at savings down the road, and savings in terms of court time, savings in terms of theoretically, and savings in terms of community um, theft and other other crimes. So Potentially is there any the assessment in other states of what the savings are going forward or the benefits going forward when there's a pre-trial program? In well, I, I, don't. I think, you know, from our research in setting up these programs, uh, there is not a large body of evidence to support the efficacy of pretrial supervision programs. Not that they're not effective, but that the research isn't really there. Um, and to include in states where they have had pretrial supervision programs for a period of time. I think to Representative Wood's question, um, the goal is not necessarily to focus on violations, but is to help people navigate the system on the front end. One of the areas that there is a strong body of evidence is simply notifying somebody the day before their court date that they have a court date the next day increases their likelihood to show up. So it's those simple supports uh, and, and substance use issues, et cetera. If we can start impacting those areas on the front end, we may get higher compliance with the court process, which in turn allows us to move through a greater number of cases, hopefully people off ramp away from the justice system in the long run. Those would be the predicted or hoped for costs avoided later. But Senator Lyons, if you would like, I actually, the uh, individual who heads up the Illinois program is a, they took her from the Cook, Cook County uh, Court. Uh, Judge LaFaver Smith, who I actually spoke with about pretrial services out there and here in Vermont. And I can follow up with her about that to see what Illinois' experience has been. Can they quantify any, any savings, whether it's time or, or finances? Thank you. Martin? Yeah, I just uh, want to explore or make sure there's an understanding of uh, who may be channeling into this. You've mentioned a whole lot of 
conditions of uh, release violations, uh, and and then the individuals who have about the docket. So I think it's 33 total individuals. They're about South Mexico so, County sitting over here. Yeah. So so I all those 33 individuals aren't automatically going to go into this. That has right. to be a, a, the state's attorney will probably exercise some discretion. Will be working with the defender to see who is appropriate for this. Uh, that's actually, in fact, where some of the geographic inequities come in because uh, different states' attorneys may approach this somewhat differently. Uh, but we wanted to have it fairly broad uh, as far as the initial pool of people who could be eligible, uh, but relying on the state's attorney uh, and then that's the DOC process uh, to, to weed it out to the people who really need this or will benefit from this. I mean, I don't mean to be testifying. I'll, I'll make that into a question. Is that true? What I just said? <laughs> that there would be a, an effort to identify who is going to benefit the most. Right. Right. Absolutely. Right. right. So, so I did have a, you know, if, if an individual is uh, referred to DOC and they do the risk assessment, uh, is it true that if this is a nonviolent misdemeanor of low risk, that that might not be the person to put into this? Uh, to put into the supervision uh, program. The court's going to have to assess each individual uh, case as it comes in, but if you have the state and the defense bar saying, well, judge, we know we only have 12 slots and here's 15 <clears throat> people and here's how we, we look at them, the court will certainly consider those factors in deciding how to place someone into the program with limited availability. Um, can I ask one question that's a little bit off topic, but since I have Judge Zona here and I'm looking at the risk assessment. I'm, so if, I'll, I'll if, provide you a little. Language. All right, just a little, a little. <laughs> so, so if you have, if the DOC is conducting this risk assessment and finds that there's a, a, a P3, you know, the highest level, is that something that the court does or can take into account for setting priorities as far as when to get to that case, when to schedule that case for trial? Since this is not something which is in practice at this time, okay. I can't, it's not something that we would have done. In other words, this process doesn't exist, so we wouldn't have been faced with that. Right. Uh, I, I suspect the court could potentially take that into account but it's not something that we would normally have in front of us. And so, right, this will be new. It, it would be something new to consider. So if you could flag that, put it on your, uh, to, to monitor that, because that could be helpful for setting priorities to get cases through. Thanks. Thank you for the leeway. Yeah, you all may want. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a couple of questions. Um, would the court also be looking um, for placing a defendant on this program if there is a risk of non-appearance or a risk to public safety or flight? Would they also take that into consideration? Yes. Those are factors the court would need to consider when determining uh, under the statute to, whether or not someone's going to be placed into the program. So it's more than just uh, a violation of current conditions or that they have five or more documents. Right. The statute sets forth uh, criteria that the court would have to assess, and those factors are included. Okay. So my other question is, um, in terms of the policies and procedures that DOC put out, in terms of having the probation of PMP officer being named as party to the case, does that raise any flags? Does that work for you folks? Is there any concern there? It's already done. Uh, for instance, this morning, if we look right now at the uh, Orleans County probate, Orleans County criminal docket, many cases have a probation officer who was already listed in the docket sheet. Uh, I haven't been able to confirm yet whether or not that means they're getting notice of every hearing, but I believe that means they get notice of the hearing. The one question, so as far as being able to add a probation officer, it's generally done at the end of the case uh, if there's a violation of probation, as Mr. Cormier said. Uh, if uh, this program goes forward, the question would be for trial court operations, is there a, an identifier that can be put in such that the probation office for the supervisor is put in immediately, he or she would, would be added? 
I know Terry Persons mentioned a few minutes ago that if we did that, it would make sense that they'd be using the name supervised, like supervision, pretrial supervision, as opposed to just probation officer, because what is the legislature going to want to know in the future? Mm -hmm. You're going to want to know how many people have been put on it and is there a way to assess it? So Terry's idea was we need to make sure that there's a different name there, possibly, to identify it for data generation in the future. Other questions? Dr. Dre? You're off the hook. And I do have to, I would have to be remiss if I did not comment on one thing. Uh, I know, uh, Chair Emmons, you ask about all the time. My understanding is that last week there was a judicial referral to home detention. How many folks are now on home detention? As of this morning, the number is still five. <laughs> but again, that's a factor of a, a number of, of things. But I did want to let you know that uh, a judge did, I, I'm aware, make a referral that last week on case. <laughs> so I want to offer time to the Defender General in case you want to weigh in on anything at all on this. Well, I wonder if it's uh, in anybody's interest. <laughs> but I, well, I, think, not. I think I should. Identify yourself for the record, please. Didn't, but um, I'm Matt Valerio, I'm the Defender General. The thing, that, this is the first time I've seen this internal document that was uh, floated around. I will, the defense bar was not part of the uh, discussion in developing this. And the thing that I'm struck by, just at first glance, and I haven't, you know, I haven't sat down and gone through it line by line, but one of the things Al Cormier has said is that this is pretty much the same kind of intake that we do when we're doing a probation um, intake. This is very different. One of the things that you have to remember is that every person who's coming in at this level is innocent as a matter of law. And as in that, given that, they have certain rights to not provide information against themselves, to not testify against themselves, to not sign releases, to not, um, you know, conditions of release typically say to you, do certain things so that we ensure that you are not going to run away. Do certain things to make sure that you are going to show up in court. Keep in contact with certain people so we know how to get a hold of you so that you won't run away and that you'll show up in court. And we haven't changed the constitution with regard to that. So when we're talking about compliance, when it comes to like probation, how many people don't sign releases? Well, they've been convicted already. Um, so there's no question that the vast majority of them, probably almost none, uh, would refuse to sign um, you know, releases for treatment and the like that uh, may end up in a violation of their probation that would put them in jail. In these circumstances, I can envision many situations where defense counsel would advise their client to not sign that release. Um, and perhaps other things that are kind of typical of probation that would be contrary to the best interest <clears throat> of defending the charges that are against them. Um, so, I believe that pretrial services can be a really effective tool um, for people who are amenable to it and whose charges are such that it, it, it can all work to a positive resolution of what's going on. Um, however, the thing that everybody has to remember, and this is why I have a little bit of concern with existing probation officers being the people coming in to implement the new program, is they're going to come at it, in my estimation, as they come at their probation cases, which is, you know, you violate your probation, I can have you arrested, I can put you in jail, or if you're parole, on parole, I can yank you in, like, immediately, and you're going to have a, you know, uh, discussion with the parole board about it, this is a different ball game because the people have not been convicted of what they are on conditions for. They're put there for particular reasons, or they have, and these are the ones who are going to be most successful, they're, they're there because they have agreed 
to be part of this program because their lawyer and themselves jointly see a benefit to being able to access resources and the like going forward. Now, remember, I, and you'll see the uh, same thing in our side, that violation of conditions of release are the number one thing that we deal with. The reason we have violation of conditions of release is we have a massive backlog and existing people sitting on a docket for years and years and years, so over a period of time, eventually people are gonna violate the conditions of release. And that's without people specifically watching them. Um, the more people you have watching, the more people, the more people you are going to find doing things. And you know, right now, when we're talking about, and I would, if I were a commissioner demo, and I was talking about the seat is your I'm not going to go there. <laughs> um, but the, if I were trying to calculate costs of this, um, you have to think of the $100,000 a year bed that the Department of Corrections has. I'm using round numbers. I know it's high 90s at this point. Um, of the people who will violate, who are being watched now, who weren't being watched before. I'm not saying they shouldn't necessarily be violated. I'm just saying the more you watch, the more you catch, and the more people are going to build jail cells. So when you're talking about cost avoidance, um, you have to make sure that you're targeting it at the people who are the most dangerous, the high risk, high need, danger to the public people, not the repeat offense property crime people who have 25 dockets. And I know when this was coming forward, the, the most annoying people were the high, were the low risk, high annoyance, you know, 50 count people on Church Street who is what drove this, you know? Um, so I'll be interested to see how this rolls out. Uh, you know, if I were, I've had a fair amount of success budgeting in the state for the last 25 years. Um, and if I were going to be budgeting on this. Um, the estimation that that I, when I, would, I did this last year, just trying to figure out, well, what if we did, what if we did this? What if somehow they put this in the Defender General's office? The, the number I came up with was twice what the Department of Corrections came up with that they told me about today. Um, because I would be thinking about those collateral costs um, that would result from violations going forward uh, where people are not, you know, right now you're not catching people doing certain things that they're going to be, we're creating opportunities for new violations with things that, with requirements under the pretrial supervision program. The biggest thing we can do to get violation of conditions to release down is to get rid of the backlog. That, that is thing number one. Um, this is going to potentially make incremental change in that. Um, but my estimation is if you're talking about costs, um, there needs to be a cost benefit analysis. And I think that doing the pilot is going to be one of the ways we make that determination. Um, everybody knew that six hundred thousand dollars wasn't going to cover, you know, it, it it wouldn't cover you know twenty five percent of Chittenden County. Forget about the state. Uh, so the only reason I wanted to talk about this is because I wouldn't want it anybody to go into this with rose colored glasses, thinking now we're providing this opportunity for folks to all get well and. Even if we're 50, if you're 50% successful, it would be the most wildly successful thing, you know, that, that the legislature has created in the last 20 years. But, you know, if you make 10% of the people go away, it would still be very, very you know, as a uh, uh, help 10%, that's still going to be very, very successful. So don't, don't look at it in terms of um, the only 10% of the people benefited you know when this comes back when you get this result and you see oh only 10 percent of the people were successful in this that's going to be a huge win i think if you get there and it's going to cost a fair amount more money than 
you know, I mean, everybody knew the 600,000 wasn't going to do it, but I think that the numbers are way out of whack. Um, you know, other states do this a little bit differently. Um, Illinois, I don't like to, you know, Cook County in Illinois is not maybe the best place to compare to Vermont. Um, there are a lot of differences in the way they they, but they did create a pretrial services program, which is good. Massachusetts has where I practiced before I came to Vermont. I granted it was 35 years ago, um, but still a long time ago, they, um, they attached their probation department to the court, not to the department of corrections. So when they have pretrial their, their attempts at pretrial supervision run directly to it all. It's really like contempt because it's all based, it's run through the court and it's by court order. Um, you know, so the people who are complaining, there's some weirdness about the, the kind of the prosecutor, the probation officer, parole officer, and the court working in the same place, but that's a whole other thing. You know, everybody does things differently. Um, but, you know, their success hasn't been great, um, but there are a lot of differences down there too. All I'm saying is this is a really new thing for Vermont. Uh, years ago, myself, uh, P.J. Donovan, the new state's attorney at, in Chittenden County, and Andy Polito um, signed on to get a grant from Senator Leahy that uh, basically created a Chittenden County style pretrial services program um, that I'm not sure what the data, PJ at the time indicated that it was very, very successful for the people who took, uh, took advantage of it and it was, but it was voluntary. Um, I don't know how success, I, I never really had any sonic data on it, um, but I have no reason to believe that it didn't have some positive impact. Um, and that was about a quarter of a million dollars that we had at the time to to make it work, and it was in one case case manager who did the uh, um, the screening, who he hired away from my office, was a lawyer from my office, and they had one law enforcement person, I think, who used to be state state police or uh, used to be state police. But anyway, they um, and you know there was indications that it could be successful. So I have the belief that this has the potential to do the right kinds of things for the people who are voluntary, who are amenable to it. Um, people who are ordered into it, you're gonna run into some issues as far as uh, like the legality of what they might be ordered to do before they're ever convicted of something. And I wanted to make sure that when we come back later, that somebody told you about that before it ever started. Appreciate that, Matt. Thank okay. you. Questions? Matt? All right, thank you. Thank you. So I know we're running over, and we anticipated this would happen. I know that uh, at 1130, we wanted some updates from DOC, um, but we really need to <clears throat> figure out as a committee how we want to move forward here with the recommendations that to give on um, the rollout of this pretrial supervision program. So would folks be willing to go into about quarter after 12, 1230, and then take a short lunch? Quarter after 12 is what we'll shoot for. I may have to go over a little. But... Yes, yeah, so I've got a meeting scheduled, so yeah. Whatever. Um, where are we as a committee? in terms of the rollout recommendations, we need to be a part of this decision, not just these. So that part of the thinking is the legislature can't come back and blame DOC for not doing its work. We're at the table too. Mark. I mean, I, I think lies where they're starting, but I would like to see the rollout plan um, rather than wait to see how the pilot works to then plan. Let's wait to see how the pilot works and then we can pull back. Uh, but I'd rather have the assumption is that they're rolling to the next county in a certain period of time, et cetera. 
Well, I know I'm not on the committee, so take my feedback for what it's worth. I mean, I, I hear that, Representative, and uh, I, I agree with you that structure and rule of plans are usually the best way forward. And, and I think we can support that from a documentation, you know, design standpoint. But realistically, with the resources that are allocated to this program presently, we could maybe roll this program into two counties. Right. Two different district offices. And beyond that, we're then kind of at capacities. Yeah, no, and I would suggest that as part of that, um, that there's an explanation of what the resources are going to be needed for step three mm -hmm. or whatever in step four, et cetera. Okay. You know, so that, that we can start understanding what that's going to look like. So the, this is a statewide program. So, and I think I'm agreeing with Representative Ballon that we should see what it would be like to have a statewide program. Resources aside, I mean, obviously the ask for resources will come through the budget and then decisions will be made through the appropriations process. Uh, the, um, but we did, the, it is in statute um, to have a statewide program. It's not a pilot. And um, I'm thinking about another bill that we passed into law this year where we asked for a statewide program, but we also pulled back and said, let's just do it, let's just do it in one area first. So that's happening. But the guidelines that are being written for that other program are statewide. So, so if you say supervisor, that's the new, that's the new term, you know, pretrial supervisor. Uh, and that the, the goal is to make sure that folks meet their court dates and that they understand their responsibilities with respect to their pretrial um, services program, whatever they're in. So I'm agreeing with Representative Lalonde. I think we should ask for that, for that full explication of full policy and, and then to ensure that all the things that we heard from the judiciary and somewhat of what we heard from the Defender General, that this is not a punitive program. This is a program to help people get through a process. We know there'll be resistance, um, but it, you know, so be it. So I, I won't say any more, but I did, I did get suggestions earlier and I'll, I'll let the rest go. So what I'm hearing, we've got two pieces to this. First off, do we give the okay to do the first part of the rollout up in Essex and Orleans County based on the Newport field office? Do we approve that? Would we make that recommendation? Do you need a motion for that? Or I'm, just, just raise our hands. I can just raise your hands. I'm, I'm okay with that. As long as the what you're talking about happens, the rollout. I think that's the next. That's the next piece that I'm seeing. We sort of have to get it started because we have to make a recommendation by September first. So they, DOC, has proposed that they would roll it out. The first place they would do it would be within their PMP office up in Newport. So. As part of the statewide program. As part of the statewide program, limited funding, 600,000, five positions. The positions have been allocated, but they haven't come online. Did, did we hear that all those positions were needed in Newport? No, they're not. They're going to do not. one. Or could we afford them? Right. Like six okay. So what you we're hearing is. Yeah. yeah. And, and whatever it is, one or two of those five would be used for that. But yeah. with a plan. Going forward. going forward for the rest of the state. How many staff would you need for the new port? One? Well, we proposed, when we testified to this last session, we proposed one free trial supervision officer for the district office, so that's 12, and two administrative staff to support the state wide system. So 14. Here's um, so I'm okay with relying upon the department's recommendation for where they think that this can sort of, you know, best be started. I'm, um, I'm not as um, in line, I guess, with the previous two comments. I mean, I think we need a, a 
rollout plan. Um, but I also think that we should wait for some data before allocating for, you know, it'll be through the budget process. I get that. But uh, I think we should wait for some time and data before we just automatically assume that this is the way we should allocate the limited resources that we have. So, and I'm, I'm not sure that we will have that for FY26. We might get something from Illinois. From the as Judge Zone, right? Yes, right. Yeah, right. Pat, yeah. There, there may be other places to sure. get data and make some comparative information. So, so yes, in terms of relying on their recommendation for um, the Newport office, yeah. And, and I'm, I guess I'm a little unclear about how the resources would be used because if we're not at a statewide program yet, why would we need two administrative staff out of that five or six know. positions? We yeah. wouldn't yet. Yeah, that, that would be part right. of the state. If, if we were able to launch the statewide system resourced for our recommendation for how you resource the entire part, it would require administrative staff. At this stage, we likely would only hire one staff member and use the balance of that money to uh, electronic monitoring equipment, any other program costs, and there'd probably be a, a balance of the other that we could roll with the broader program when that came on. So how I'm seeing this is we can give our recommendation to, yes, take the first step, go with a Newport proposal. But we want to see DOC back at our next meeting with maybe some parameters, some thoughts on what should remain, what the rollout would look like um, going forward. Stay away. And that we continue to work on that uh, between now and the end of the year, because it's going to be a process. It's going to be a process, and I think also what needs to be at the table, people need to be realistic in terms of what the cost is going to be. I think that's one of the big pieces, and somehow we may have to work in how are we going to measure the outcomes of this. So we're just not funding a new program, but we don't know if it's being fit. That, I guess that was my point. Right. Is there anything in the statute that talks about data collection and no, analysis? I don't yeah, that's, that's, a big, that's a missing piece. And, and sure, if I may too, uh, November 1st may be a good target date since that's yeah. when the recommendations have to go to the General Assembly. And, and then policies and procedures need to be in place. Right. For that. So that's why I'm thinking the next meeting, which is in September, and then we have a meeting in October. That's that's what I was thinking. Nader, your hands up. Thank you. Uh, so I'm 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 supportive of the initial rollout. Uh, I'm also supportive of uh, at least providing the green light for the statewide rollout because I don't know that there would uh, necessarily be anything uh, to prohibit us from. You know, if we were to get information from DOC after the pilot program, I don't think there would be anything that would prohibit us from saying, you know, we've learned about such and such factors. We actually have to put a pause on the green light that we previously gave for the statewide program so that we can make some changes. Uh, you know, I'm just trying to think of a way to make it so that there's less uh, that, that there's less hurdles uh, down the road in getting a statewide program going. So I think for clarity, I think it would be very helpful if we had a motion on the table for this. Um, because I know, I know as the time goes by, we look back and say, well, what did the committee really mean? So I think it's really important that we do have a motion and that we vote on the motion. Before you do them, um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to say my um skepticism about this program always attached to the money. Mm -hmm. um, Senator Sears was a big proponent and he wanted a statewide program. The money was not there. And so we went in a kind of half fashion with the 600 mm -hmm. plus, but with a commitment statewide. So I just wanted to underline what Senator Hashim said about the possibility that we pause down the road or even don't move the program statewide down the road because the testimony as I understood it was that the number one thing we could do would be to reduce the backlog. And we put big resources into that last time out, new judges, 
new resources for all the involved parties, but it wasn't enough and it's not enough going forward. We're gonna be asked again to up all of those numbers. So I continue to have a certain amount of skepticism fueled in part by numbers like those Matt was um, roughing out for us. Um, so with that said, I think the committee is adopting a very cautious approach. That's good. The department has offered a cautious approach. So I support the caution and just wanted to underline um, that with regard to what's going to come due in the budget. Madam Chair, um, I, I think part of the rollout has to have um, some kind of an evaluation component as part of the rollout, too. And, and that, I think, supports what set up here. That's, that's it being in the red light there. Because if it's not working the way we think, then we're going to stop it. So I think part of that rollout has to have some kind of evaluation. Oh, maybe some of that money um, that is not being used for staff could be used for that. So why don't we make a uh, motion that I'm sure it's written down <laughs> <laughs> a rough that supports the initial um, program in Newport in the Newport area as presented by the Department of Corrections with some slight modifications. We made a few suggestions, and that the Department of Corrections put forward a plan for a broader geographic rollout of the program with an understanding that two things happen. One, that the legislature is recommended to put in place a data collection and analytic process analysis this may end up being two motions, but having an analysis in place. Um, and two, that um, we continue to gather data as the program goes forward so that um, prior to any further expansion of the program, um, the legislature has an opportunity to analyze the results. So that was a long, Motion, but there are components of it. Yeah. Ben has it. I know. Let him finish it and then read it back to us. Well, it might be more than one motion, but it's all the things that we well, just all heard about. It's connected. Yeah. It's all, basically, we accept their proposal. We want them to come back with a rollout plan, how that's going to be structured. That's going to take some time over a couple of meetings and also the evaluation of the program is going to be. That would, that would determine further implementation. Right. And then we can determine if we continue to move forward. Okay. If there's so money Matt, there. you want to read it. So read the motion, to paraphrase a little bit, sure. <laughs> is kind of twofold. Um, Sarah Lyons moves to support the initial rollout of the program in Newport as recommended by the department. And two, Prior to the statewide rollout, um, this committee recommends that the department engage in data collection and analysis for the General Assembly to review prior to the full state rollout. So in that, do will there be, I think we would like to see a plan for the statewide rollout the, so that we can understand what it is we're... So what you read is number two should be number three. Yeah. And a number two that is uh, required. A, they come report. back. Yeah. A plan for the total rollout. And number four is where's the. Well, yeah. that's you and. I mean, that's the rest a lot of, of work. work that you've got more meetings. You break this down to a couple of Yeah. I, I, I had a quick question on, on the verbiage. What you said that this committee recommends the department. I would think that we want to require the department to come back with those statistics for us versus recommend. I don't mean that to you. So let's break that down into two motions. Let's take care of the Newport and the rollout in the first motion. So you mean the rollout plan? The rollout plan. Yeah. Plans can always change. 
So what have you that written? So for, for that one, uh, move that the committee supports the initial program in Newport as recommended by the department and that the department be required to submit a statewide rollout plan to the committee by by January 1st. What's the November date? November, November 1st. 1st is their policies and procedures need to be in place for the oh. And it's also your recommendations mm -hmm. to the General Assembly on. Could we do the, November 1st? That would give us a couple now it's nine, so November 1st. Five, five, five. So, and so, do we want to put anything in there about any recommendations for legislative improvements? Like, mm -hmm. for example, the data collection piece or that kind of thing. So, the first motion that Jimmy that Jimmy made, not for Jimmy made okay, is well, that yeah. we recommend that POC is the first stage of the rollout does Newport, and then by November first, they would come back to us for uh, proposals on how to roll this out statewide. That's the first motion. There is a second to that. Second. I moved and seconded. Bill Blue seconded. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? So it was unanimous. Now the second motion is pertaining to the evaluation and data collection. And why don't you read what Jenny put out, what words nothing. Um, that the, this committee recommends that the department implement data collection and analysis so that the General Assembly has an opportunity to analyze it prior to the full state rollout. So we want to include um, data collection from other states. So in so the department in collaboration with the other courts, partners. yeah, others um, look at programs in other states and any data available as the program. <clears throat> In Vermont rolls up because so that's not going to happen for a while. Right. So other states are probably more important. And I'm looking at judge zone. I think we need to have the word require rather than what we. Oh. Or yeah. shall require. Shall. Would you pick that up? Yeah. 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 So the evaluation and data collection would happen over time. Yeah, there's no date <clears throat> to that. It's over time. Yeah, except, except Madam Chair, we're not going to continue implementing the rollout plan unless we've got information that's positive. Thank you. We have to have, have, to have those positions allocated. I mean, online. And those positions are online. Can't even get the new port one going until the position comes online. So, what I have is that the OC is required in consultation with others to examine programs in other states and any available data on the efficacy of similar programs so the General Assembly can review the data prior to the state right of implementation. So, you moved, Jenny. Yes, I know that. Is there a second? <laughs> It works for me. Bob wants to second. Okay. I'll make that motion. Okay, it's pretty for me. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's already been made. Okay. The committee meeting. Well, the committee <laughs> So I'm not going to have Ben reread it. It's basically do an evaluation back with it. Um, any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Who is the second? Uh, $7. Um, we knew that was going to take some time. This is going to take time. It is quarter after 12. We do need an update from DOC. Um, I'm willing to push that off until 1 o'clock. If you want to do that, 
I want to hear about the Medicaid waiver, the 1115 waiver, detainee population, other things. And then we'll go into the what's scheduled for the women's facility and also the juvenile facility. So thank you, folks. So we'll be back here at 1 o'clock.